Hi, I'm Matt B. And welcome to M2M, the channel that burns the nonsense. Sometimes you'll come across a flat earth channel with a reasonable small amount of subscribers, but doing okay. It produces a video more out of lack of knowledge than ignorance or arrogance. We sometimes come across with the bigger flat earthers. And I think this one is more about lack of knowledge. So I'd like to see this as more of an education and a debunk. So this is what I'd like to do. I'd like to help him out a little bit and educate him. Because this one seems to have a bit of a problem with the space shuttle launch. So, shall we help him out? Let's launch the credits and let's get into it. So this is the video we're looking at from a channel name by the name of Paul Not Down Under. I'm assuming he's either New Zealand or Aussie uh, flat earther. Um, the video of the title is Space Shuttle Dash Cam NASA Lies. Dash Cam. Okay. Right. Well, let's have a look at the video. CGI glitches, no delay comms, and bubbles on the space shuttle dash cam. Oh, the old space bubbles. Okay. Sound suppression water system has been activated, protecting Discovery and the launch pad from acoustical energy waves. Go for main engine start. We have main engine start. Two, one. So this guy is obviously not speaking. Um, he's gone straight in with and watch for the amazing external tank struts that defy friction at 14,000 miles per hour. This is pretty much the whole premise of his video, as you'll see later on. Booster ignition and the final liftoff of Discovery. A tribute to the dedication, hard work and pride of America's space shuttle team. The shuttle has cleared the tower. Discovery now making one last reach for the stars. Discovery's engines are now throttling down as the orbiter passes. Why don't we ever hear the sonic boon on takeoff? Ah, Paul, this is your first lesson. So you're going to pay attention, Paul. I think you'll like this. So, Paul, a sonic boom occurs when an aircraft, or in this case, a rocket, i.e. the space shuttle, reaches about 750 miles per hour, which is around Mach 1.1. So the shuttle, or any rocket, takes a little bit of time to reach that speed after liftoff. And the reason it occurs is because the sound waves of an aircraft or rocket are compressed because the rocket is travelling faster than the sound waves can move towards you. And it's happening continuously as long as it is still travelling above 750 miles an hour. So you hear the sound in one single boom. Now the key difference between an aircraft racing past you and a rocket is obvious. If it isn't obvious to you Paul, well, the shuttle is moving up in the air. Unlike an aircraft racing past you where the sonic waves are travelling in ripples perpendicular towards you and you hear it, Here it is. the shuttle is way above your head and the sonic waves from the shuttle travel parallel to the ground above you, hence why you don't hear the sonic boom when it reaches that mag magic number of Mach 1.1. Now I hope that makes sense to you Paul and I hope you learned something here. 
So let's carry on with the rest of the video. Discovery Houston, you are go at throttle up. Discovery's three main engines are burning fuel at a rate that would drain an average swimming pool in about 25 seconds. The engines combined with the solid rocket boosters produce more than 7 million pounds of thrust. Flight information to reaffirm the fantastic illusion of space flight in your mind from childhood. So you're using a reaffirmation to reaffirm that NASA is creating an illusion of space. Okay, I don't you think it's a little bit hypocritical? Anyway, never mind. Let's carry on with the video. One minute, 50 seconds into the flight, we're standing by for separation of the twin solid rocket boosters. Discovery now traveling 2,695 miles an hour. It's altitude 24 miles. Downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, 29 miles. Two minutes, 25 seconds into the flight, Discovery traveling 3,189 miles an hour. It's altitude 37 miles, downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, 53 miles. Let me know when you're ready to copy the new press to ATO and press to Miko. Okay, copy all, two engine tail and ready to copy. Two and a half second time delay between comms. So, so don't you think the pilot or wherever it was that was responding Needs time to disseminate the question asked, probably to look at some instruments and displays, and then give an appropriate reply. I mean, how long or how short should it be? Until you're pressed to ATO 11 depth. No visible air friction or distortion or distress on non aerodynamic dynamic struts at 4,700 miles per hour. Ah, I think it's time for lesson number two, Paul. So as we saw a moment ago in your video, Paul, at 2 minutes and 25 seconds into the flight, the shuttle is currently in an altitude of about 37 miles and at a velocity of just under 3,200 miles per hour. But you're expected to see, and I quote, air friction, distortion or distress on the non-aerodynamic struts. Firstly, Paul, the struts that we'll see shortly are not non-aerodynamic. The shuttle was fully tested for aerodynamics before human beings flew on the first manned shuttle on STS-1 in 1981. But the lesson I'm going to give you here is all about air pressure at high altitudes, Paul. So the shuttle is currently at an altitude of 37 miles, which puts the shuttle going past an altitude of 60 kilometers plus by the time you pointed out in the video, which puts it firmly within the range of the mesosphere. At this altitude, the air pressure is in the range of 0.01 millibars, or 0.00014 pounds per square inch. So seeing that at sea level, we see air pressures of about 1,000 millibars, or 14.7 psi, we can say there, is, say there is very, very little atmosphere to put any kind of pressures on any part of the space shuttle. I hope this helps you, Paul, and here ends lesson number two. Let's carry on with the video. Decimal nine, press to Miko, one five decimal four. Three minutes and 50 seconds into the flight, the shuttle traveling 4,700 miles an hour. 0 0.01 millibars of air pressure, Paul. 11 decimal, 11 decimal nine and one five decimal four. It's a good read back on both. Ah, Paul, at this point they're on an altitude of 65 kilometers. They're not on the moon. They use communications is by S-band and it's digitized. The delay in comms is minuscule, milliseconds. The only delay is the res delay in the response between the pilot and the ground control or vice versa. Have a look at S-band communications, Paul. Discovery can now make it to emergency landing sites in Europe should one of the engines fail, but all three engines continue to perform as expected. Or more affirmations about reaffirmations. <laughs> and we've got the old space bubbles coming. Oh, goody. Credit where credit's due, Paul. It's very well spotted. 
It's not easy to see. But no, not space bubbles, Paul. Now it's time for lesson number three. Are you ready? For this lesson, Paul, I'm going to teach you just a little bit about cryogenic fuels. Cryogenic fuels are described as fuel that require them to be kept at extremely low temperatures to maintain a liquid state. Now the space shuttle used two cryogenic fuels, liquid hydrogen or LH2 as a fuel and liquid oxygen or LOX or better known as LOX as an oxidizer. Now liquid hydrogen LH2 and all cryogenic fuels had as what is known as a boiling point and LH2 in this case has a boiling point of minus 252 degrees Celsius or minus 421 Fahrenheit which means if it, if it goes above that point it boils and returns to its natural state as a gas. Very much like boiling a petal, kettle pool, water or H2O has a boiling point of around plus 100 degrees Celsius so when that boils it turns to a vapour called steam. Are you with me so far Paul? Good. Now liquid oxygen or LOX has a slightly higher boiling point of minus 218 degrees Celsius or minus 361 Fahrenheit. So as I'm sure you can agree Paul those temperatures are bloody cold right? So as the shuttle is sitting on the launch pad fairly close to sea level full of extremely cold liquids Guess what's going to happen, Paul? Yes, you guessed it. On the external parts of the tanks are going to get a bit frosty. And I don't mean angry. I mean ice is going to form on the outside of those tanks. So you see, Paul, those bubbles you think you've seen are not bubbles at all. They are ice crystals coming off the tanks. As the tanks are depleted of those cryogenic fuels, the ice crystals are no longer frozen to the tanks and break off simples. So there ends lesson number three. You did pretty well Paul, you've learned a lot today. But I'm going to leave it there Paul as I don't want to overload you with too much information. But besides in the rest of the video you talk more about aerodynamic pressures which I've covered, more about comms delays which I've covered and CGI bubbles <laughs> which I've just covered. So there's nothing really much more to say. So, for those of you watching this video, I've put a link to Paul's video in the description. Now, if you think he's right, go and subscribe to his channel for more um, uh, videos. If you think I'm right, please click the subscribe button, hit the bell icon, and you should be notified when I upload more videos. But Paul, for now, sorry mate, but your video has just been burned. <laughs>